What up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Nerd J Report. I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me, as always, is Mr. Brian Schultz. Brian, we've stated on the show that Thor, Love, and Thunder was going to be one of Marvel's best movies. We had our concerns about the goofiness of this movie that it would be much more goofy than Ragnarok. And based on some of the reviews that we've gotten and some of the reviews that I've heard from people whom I follow, Campia and others, they said something very key, Brian. Especially for me when John Campia said this. If you didn't like Ragnarok for what they did, you're not going to like this. If you loved Ragnarok and enjoyed it and you had a good time, you're going to love this movie because it's a hundred times that. I already bought my tickets. I'm going to go see it. But I know I'm going to be very disappointed in what I see, Brian. I don't know what to say. Brian, what are your thoughts? Does this movie make a billion dollars? Because again, we're very in the we're in the minority about how we feel about Ragnarok and perhaps or how we feel, how will how we will feel about uh Thor Love and Thunder. What do you, what, what are your thoughts? I think we had this movie kind of pegged in a sense of I don't think we guarantee that it would be MCU's best. I think what we what we discussed was there was a path, yeah, yeah, where it could be, and yeah. here are the elements. And it seems like you know this is spoiler free. I don't like to read full reviews ahead of time because they give away too much. Yeah, <clears throat> but I like to pick up on themes. I like to look for recurring mentions, topics. I think we had a peg, which was. There was a path and it was, you know, Christian Bale had to be epic. They had to really deliver the sort of mighty Thor, Jane Foster's health kind of storyline in a compelling way. And then you would trust that kind of Hemsworth would level up his performance and you would kind of preserve the levity, but maybe dialed it down because some of the subject matter is just too serious, right? We're talking about Gore the God Butcher inspired by the death of his family. And, you know, if, if Jane Foster's going to sacrifice herself in the name of becoming the God of Thunder, you know, those are things that the comics dealt with in a very sort of uh, emotional way. So it's kind of like, all right, keep the taika of it, dial that back, you know, 10 to 20 percent and you know, let Bale, Portman, and Hemsworth cook. And if you do that, you probably can get to a place where this is, you know, top shelf Marvel. Yeah. So, but our concern was that Taika Waititi, because he delivered a huge hit, had free reign on this movie. And then that he would kind of channel his inner James Gunn and crank the volume on the goofy. Even though the subject matter was serious. And in doing so, he would create something of a mess and you would kind of waste the opportunity here. Seems like we got a little of both. That's what I, I, I get from the review. So as it stands by the numbers, I think it's a big surprise. 129 reviews at the time you and I are recording. It is 71% fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. Put that in perspective. Um, you know, Eternals is the worst reviewed Marvel movie. That's at about 50%. But, you know, perhaps more topical, you know, Ragnarok was 93. That was one of the highest regarded, critically acclaimed Marvel films. Thor 1, 77. Dark World, 66. So this movie, at least in the eyes of critics, is slotting in as the third of the Thor franchise. And is, tr and like, usually when reviews come out, that percentage will tend to go down over time. Uh, after the first day, 
So this is looking like it might wind up being on par critically with Thor The Dark World, which is pretty much unilaterally regarded as the worst Marvel movie. Um, the reasons are exactly what we fear. That this is a mess, that the humor has been cranked to a level that it's like incomprehensible to almost mind numbing. And that this I thought was really interesting. There's a so there's a lot of people, a lot of reviews that are saying this, that tonally this movie oscillates from very serious because of the subject matter to very goofy because of the style. And it just doesn't work side by side over two hours. That yeah. is literally what we would have told you is the fear around taking this comic storyline and using Taika's style on this movie. So I'm with you. I already got the pan ready. I'm like, I'm <laughs> like ready, ready to pan this movie when we come back and review it. I will give it a shot. But yeah. I'm concerned and I am already like, oh no, really? Like we're really gonna do this? I'm going in there. I I mean, and I'm hope and hopefully, Brian, when I go see the movie, I'm pleasantly surprised at uh it that 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 I like it. But and I'm, I'm not into goofy too much with these sort of stories and and, and the MCU. I'm not into the goofiness. I I, I like the humor, yes, but the goofiness, that's where you sort of lose me. Um, so it does seem like some of the performances came through. So I've seen a couple of reviews mentioning Christian Bale as delivering an Oscar worthy performance with his portrayal of gore. A um, lot of depth. That's crazy. People saying like, yeah, even though he's named Gore the God Butcher, you do empathize with him at points. So that's something worth seeing. Seen it several other reviews um, praising Natalie Portman's take on, on Mighty Thor and Jane Foster. Hemsworth is kind of, I would say, getting third billing in this. People are like, oh, he's always he's never bad. It almost taken him for granted. But yeah, yeah. They, those three seem to be kind of the strong points of the movie. But you know, the phrase I saw, I sent it to you, rom com with epic battles, like, you know, that's coming up a lot. And there's a lot of reviews kind of talking about even these are people who see liked Ragnarok, like reviewers who are like, hey, I thought Ragnarok was great. And then this was just too much. Like a lot of that. Like I liked Ragnarok, but this was a step back. Like not saying it's awful, but just like it just didn't recapture the magic. I don't know, man. You asked about a billion dollars. I'm kind of taking the under. I mean, after yeah. Doc Strange 2 Me didn't get didn't quite get there. It's a little bit of a more crowded marketplace now in the summer, right? Like, look at what's out right now. There's definitely stuff that's still pulling people into the theater. You know, Minions, big weekend. Top Gun Maverick's going to be a top 10 movie of all time. All time. That thing is, like, I think it had the second biggest sixth weekend ever. Um, yeah. And Jurassic is still out there. Like, there's a lot going on. Like, I just think this thing might equal the last one which was kind of like around 800 but with these reviews if they keep sinking i don't i don't know i think marvel might come up short of a billion again here yeah yeah well yeah uh that's why san diego comic con is so uh important so vital to what the future holds for the mcu uh because right now what we've been getting is and you threw around that word, those two words that that sort of give me shivers every time I hear it, is free reign. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know, Brian. We've had our discussions about this. We're not gonna dive too deeply into it because we, we said it over and over. I'm always afraid of giving free reign to directors. Uh, because they do whatever they want. And for some, they haven't been successful. And Marvel has been, in the beginning, they had a, oof, they were hit, hitting a lot. They, there were some, a few misses, but not as much as we've gotten in this phase. In terms of the only movie that I can feel excited and 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 I was really looking forward to seeing it 
um, and was and, and was just pleasantly surprised at how great it was, was No Way Home. That was the last time I felt this way before a movie. I haven't felt that since. Uh, some of the shows have been great. Moon Knight, I loved. That, that was a show that I was looking forward to seeing every week. Um, but um, again, that excitement has come few and far between. And uh, hopefully something changes because, hey, Brian, this could be Top Gun may be the one uh, film that uh, destroys the superhero genre. <laughs> Like people are gonna, I want to see stuff like this. I'm tired of the superhero stuff, you know. That's happening. I mean, and uh, I mean, yes. Shout, shouts to Tom Cruise on his superhero payday on that. By the way, if, if you, you guys Google, if you can find it, Google what his his formula is because he he might make a hundred million dollars personally off that movie. That's not a wow. joke. Like that movie's wow. getting within range of that. You know, I, to the point. Like Marvel develops this formula. The movies that were the most successful in phase one, two, and three basically were, for the most part, not all of them, were, were the ones that kind of stuck to that formula. And the directors who had the most success were the ones that were able to play within that sandbox. The yeah. so Marvel, of course, had a lot of success, but they also drew a lot of criticism, saying that that, that was constraining, right? The 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 reason why Edgar Wright, the reason why Patty Jenkins put it function in the MCU, where you were losing this director talent is because of this formula. Well, phase four, Marvel has definitely relaxed, right? Chloe Zhao, Sam Raimi, Taika Waititi, and like- And James Gunn. Listen, James Gunn, but like, and, and to be fair, all of those filmmakers have earned the right to have freedoms, right? They've made money, they've won awards, right? We're not talking about nobody's off the street getting just yeah. a complete run to do what they want. Yeah. But we are seeing the downside. As we have known for all these years at DC, all the chastising we did at Warner Brothers in DC, they've been doing this forever, which is they hire a filmmaker. And in some cases, not always, we know that Warner Brothers medals. But in some cases, they've gotten out of the way and they just said, go do your movie. And that sometimes is great and sometimes it's not. And we're finding with Marvel, maybe the Marvel formula is not so bad. And I do wonder with this Comic-Con and this Phase 5, is the formula going to come back a little bit? I'm telling you that retreat, oh man, I wish I can, I wish I would, I wish I can hear what happened in that retreat and what they when, discussed. You know, when, when you sit back and think about it, like, there's a little bit of a false sense of security from phase two and three in particular, because if you look at when they brought the Russos in and you think about what Marvel became known for, you know, the Russo brothers themselves gave you Captain America two, Captain America three, Infinity War and Endgame. That's with the same two writers, Marcus and McNeely. So that's the same team gave you four of the best products that you had. A little bit of like a low, because you're not really thinking about it, but you're like, oh, it's four different movies. No, it's the same guys doing the same, like they're cranking it out and they're not really deviating. They, they got their lane and they nailed it. Now, you know, they bring Ryan Coogler in, he crushed it. Like that mm -hmm. obviously can work. And he had enough freedom and he had a vision and they let him play it out and it, and it paid huge dividends. But we already saw like with, Captain Marvel, those were two indie filmmakers, didn't go so well. Like, it made a lot of money, but the movie was kind of uneven. You know, we've seen it in the Iron Man franchise. You know, like, Favreau was awesome out of the gate. But then, like, the Shane Black one, is, I think, is polarizing Iron Man 3. Like, it has been these moments already along the way where this has kind of happened. Uh, Thor, obviously, was very uneven before, you know, and, and you could say maybe it's still uneven, right, with what we're talking about here. Like, that's been a very up-and-down franchise. So, these seeds have been here the whole time but i think you're seeing that like only a certain type of filmmaker and a certain style of writing really meshes with what a marvel's putting out and there is so much that we've seen with jay first we start with james gunn and guardians because guardians 2 versus guardians 1 is exactly this right it's more of guardians 1 yeah. and it's not quite as good yeah. And that's what this feels like to me. It's more of Ragnarok, and that actually winds up being counterproductive to the end product. So maybe Marvel's got to tighten it up a little bit. 
I think it's fair to say, Brian, at least to me, anyway, that you can tell which directors made Marvel movies and which ones made their movie. I'll end it off with that. That's our show for the day, and we'll see you next time on the Nerd Gen Report.